actually and get started since we have two presenters this morning. And our first presenter is Nico Ronquillo, and he is an MD-PhD uh, graduate student in the Bayer Lab. He'll be speaking about the Senior Loken Syndrome. Thank you. Hello. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Leah. So good morning, everyone. Again, I'm Nico, and I'm an MD-PhD student in the lab of Wolfgang Bayer, uh, just up in the sixth floor here at the Moran. And I'll talk about today my thesis um, a project on a retina renal dystrophy in humans called senior Logan syndrome. So first I wanted to introduce to you uh, to an organelle called the primary cilium. This organelle is expressed in most cell types. And as shown in this cartoon, this organelle protrudes out um, of, of cells. As the name implies, there's only one primary cilium uh, per cell. And in contrast to the motile cilia that we usually think about lining the organs, um, the lumens of several organs, the primary cilium is, is, is non-motile. We now know that it is involved in several sensory functions, including photosensation. It's now well accepted that photoreceptor connecting cilium and outer segment is a specialized primary cilium um, because it shares the same fundamental structures as that of the primary cilium. Shown here is a cartoon of uh, the uh, structure of a primary cilium uh, and uh, classic is the nine pairs of microtubules uh, that form as a, as a tube that forms the axoneme which is basically the skeleton of a primary cilium. This axoneme is anchored by uh, the basal body. This is an EM of a photoreceptor cell showing also similar uh, structure uh, which includes the basal body as well as the classic uh, micro microtubule uh, axonemal structure in the connecting cilium. Again, this is just a cross section through, through uh, the connecting cilium. And really the connecting cilium is thought to be a gatekeeper of protein transport uh, from the inner segment to the outer segment. And this is a very small structure. Not surprisingly, mutations of genes that affect ciliogenesis or primary cilium function can manifest in uh, virtually any organ. To mention a few, bardet beetle syndrome causes obesity and polydactyly. And Juber syndrome causes uh, cerebellar vermis hypoplasia. Now, senior Loken syndrome is a ciliopathy that causes uh, uh, adretinal degeneration as well as a medullary cystic kidney disease called nephronophthesis. So more on senior Loken syndrome. This was first described in 1961 as an autosomal recessive disease uh, that causes, again, RP and nephronophthesis. Symptoms usually start in the first decade of life, and this is usually polydipsia and polyuria. The median age of end-stage kidney disease is around uh, 13, 13 years old. This is a very rare disease worldwide with a prevalence of uh, one in one million. The retinitis pigmentosa in senior Loken syndrome, I won't uh, talk uh, a lot about this, but, uh, but usually presents several years after the initial renal symptoms begin or several years after a patient has had kidney transplant. The RP in this uh, syndrome is rapidly progressing. Nephronophthesis means disintegration of the kidneys. Um, classic findings in nephronophthesis include corticomedullary cysts, as well, uh, that can be seen actually in ultrasound here, and smaller uh, to normal sized kidneys. This is important clinically because uh, most of the classic autosomal dominant uh, cystic kidney diseases are usually larger diseases. In nephronophthesis, kidneys are uh, smaller. Histological findings include interstitial fibrosis as well as the tubular cysts shown here. And there's also a lot of uh, basement membrane destruction. So three years ago, when I, uh, after joining Wolfgang's lab, so he really asked me to come up with a project that involved a d disease gene, which of course naturally interested me. And I found uh, that uh, these NPHP genes or nephrocysteine genes, um, and they're all called because all mutations in these genes all cause the kidney phenotype or nephronephthesis. But what interested, interested me the most was some of them cause uh, retinal uh, pathologies as well. And this includes NPHP 1 to 6, 8, and 10. I focused on NPHP 5 in here uh, for three reasons. First, I was struck uh, that NPHP 5, 100% of the mutations in NPHP 5 
cause the retina and renal pathologies. The second reason I, I got interested because NPHP5 mutations only cause retina and renal phenotype. There were no other organ involvement. In contrast to the other genes, uh, for example, NPHP6 or, um, or CEP290, it had a re retinal renal disease but also affected the brain. So since, uh, and I guess practically speaking, there was really no uh, functional studies on NPHP5. We don't know how it was working and uh, there were no animal models of senior locan syndrome. So uh, I was able to capitalize on Wolfgang's expertise in making knockout mice model models. And since then, it's now considered, it's now well known that mutations in NPHP5 are actually the most common cause of senior locan syndrome in humans. Again, there are several mutations that has been mapped uh, that have uh, found in families. And the main point that I wanted to say in this slide is that all the mutations cause a truncated and non-functional uh, protein, which is classic of autosomal recessive disease. So more on uh, the, uh, the protein, NPHP5 or nephrocysteine 5, it's also called IQ calmodulin binding one protein or IQCB1. Um, and it contains two IQ domains for calmodulin binding. Calmodulin is a calcium binding protein. And uh, it's, uh, it's uh, interesting or uh, tempting to speculate right now that NPHP5 is involved in calcium signaling. It interacts with RPGR and uh, NPHP6 or CEP290, which are known genes, uh, mutations that cause retinal degeneration as well. So besides that, there were really nothing else known about NPHP5. And so we came up with two hypotheses that deletion of NPHP5 in the mouse will lead to the development of the retinal degeneration and cystic kidney disease mimicking the pathology seen in humans. And the second hypothesis was uh, the function of NPHP5, which is that it is necessary for ciliogenesis or primary cilian function in photoreceptors and kidney cells. So to study NPHP5, I first confirmed localization of the protein um, in photoreceptor cells and kidney cells. So this is uh, from a polyclonal antibody from a group in uh, University of Michigan. And uh, we've uh, confirmed that uh, NPHP5 is indeed localized to the connecting cilium of photoreceptor cells. Acetylated tubulin is a known marker of a connecting cilium shown here, which I'll also use uh, this marker in several of my other assays later. So I've also confirmed NPHP5 localization in a kidney cell line called IMCD3 cells, here shown in green, um, uh, co-labeling with acetylated tubulin. So basically these cells are grown in a dish and at specific conditions these cells will grow a primary cilium, which I can label. Finally, uh, we've also tested in basically all uh, organs of the mouse. Uh, and tested for NPHP5 mRNA and shown that NPHP5 is expressed ubiquitously um, in uh, all organs, uh, except notably probably the lungs, is, it's, it's not expressed. So this result was really not surprising as other NPHP genes were uh, expressed ubiquitously, but this also was worrisome because knocking out in the mouse may cause uh, other problems in other organs where it's expressed that may lead to not viable mice. We went ahead and uh, made knockout mice using an embryonic stem cell line with a gene trap in intron 4 of NPHP5. So basically what this gene trap did was introduce a stop codon that would uh, prevent uh, protein translation, um, basically an early termination and truncation. This is just a representative genotyping results showing absence of the wild type allele in my knockout mice. And now I also confirmed the knockout uh, by, uh, by, Western, by Western, by checking uh, for protein from kidney lysates. So also in this construct, going back to this figure, uh, we have a reporter uh, called LACZ, uh, basically what, so I can basically check where endogenous NPHP5 is expressed developmentally. So I took uh, wild type, heterozygote, and knockout animals at uh, uh, E13.5 or at uh, uh, E13.5 embryonic stage and stained with XGAL for LACZ expression. So there should be no expression in the wild type and the knockout mice, uh, since they have two copies of the LACZ reporter should have stronger expression. 
And as expected, NPHP5 is expressed ubiquitously with a prominent expression uh, in the eye and other organs, uh, including the limb buds, the spinal cord, which I won't talk about too much. Uh, but if you're wondering you know, what is NPHP5 doing in these organs, uh, we do not know the answer to that, but it seems like uh, at least in the adult mice, they seem normal, except in the organs that I'll be talking more about. So again, despite ubiquitous expression of NPHP5 in the mouse, global knockout mice are viable. But uh, the first uh, science that I saw was that postnatal uh, P14 and postnatal day 28, the knockout mice seem to have uh, uh, decreased body weight compa compared to the wild type and heterozygote animals. Besides this, I also noticed that the knockout mice were dying randomly. So I uh, plotted uh, survival knockout mice in black uh, versus wild type and hets um, uh, using a Kaplan-Meier curve and shows that uh, it is a significant. So in the human disease, the kidney disease is the one that uh, uh, causes death in the patients, and we suspect that it's also the kidney disease in, um, in the knockout mice. We started characterizing the retina at P28, uh, which, uh, or one month of age, which is considered uh, young animals. So with the help of Ballas Lab, we took fundus and OCT photos of the wild type heads and knockout animals shown here, and uh, in knockout animals, we noticed thinning of the retina, which is more s better seen at OCT. However, since this is a global knockout mouse, it's really hard to say from this picture which layer of the retina is uh, involved. We next checked for rod and cone function by measuring the animal's scotopic and photopic ERG responses. So with increasing uh, uh, single flashlight intensities of dark adapted mice, so increasing from, from top to bottom, heterozygote mice at uh, one month of age seem to have normal responses. However, knockout mice have completely absent scotopic ERG responses, which suggests complete loss of rod function. So after light adaptation, we measured photopic ERG responses at increasing light intensities again. And heterozygote mice also seem to have normal responses. However, knockout mice had completely absent photopic um, responses, suggesting loss of cone function um, at one month of age. The mice were blind at one month or at P28, which suggests a very rapid retinal degeneration, especially in the mouse. So we checked for retinal function at an earlier time point uh, at P14, just right after uh, eye opening, because we really don't know whether this was a retinal degeneration problem or a uh, retinal development problem. So even at this early time point, we see this is the scotopic measurements and this is a, f a representative photopic measurements that there were absent uh, uh, ERG responses from the knockout uh, animals. So we then sectioned the retina to really see what, what was going on and look at the uh, morphology. So at P10, which is right before uh, eye opening, uh, we see already uh, thinning of the outer nuclear layer, which is more pronounced at P14. Um, and this is the outer nuclear layer of the knockout mice. And the heterozygotes seem to have normal um, uh, outer nuclear layer. And this is just quantification of, of uh, P14. At P28, I've also done uh, ICC uh, on the retina sections, green labels for dopsin and blue labels uh, uh, the, uh, photo, uh, the cell bodies. And at P28, uh, there were complete absence of the, uh, of the outer nuclear layer, which, uh, which makes sense because we did not have any ERG responses at P28. However, it didn't make sense why we didn't have any P14 signal because there were still some photoreceptor uh, cell bodies left at P14. Uh, it's hard to see in this picture whether there, uh, there's uh, outer segments uh, involved. And so the hypothesis was that uh, at P14, um, outer segments really don't develop. And, uh, and the hypothesis that NPHP5 is important in connecting cilium structure and function uh, one, one, one can easily look at rhodopsin for proper localization of rhodopsin at early time points. So at P10, heterozygote mice uh, have normal uh, localization of rhodopsin in the developing outer segment shown here in green. So in knockout mice, however, it doesn't seem that rhodopsin get uh, transported normally. So uh, there's two things happening here. First, accumulation of rhodopsin in green in the, uh, near the cell bodies of the, uh, of the photoreceptor layers. 
And it's harder to see here, but it, uh, the, the green signal in here seemed to be in the inner segment of the outer segment. If you look at in the wild type and head, there seems to be a black line uh, which is in the inner segment of, of, um, of, uh, of these sections and rhodopsin is, I guess, uh, uh, more distally from that. And in here, there's, uh, it's, it's harder to see, but there's no uh, black line, which suggests that it's accumulating in the inner segment. We're trying to confirm these results now. We're just waiting for our EM, EM experiments to check whether <coughs> with the ultrastructure of the connecting cilium, as well as to see whether the outer segments tr uh, actually develop even initially. At P14, uh, we also checked for uh, cone, uh, for cone outer segments, shown here with cone arrestin in red, and shown here are beautiful cone outer segments. But as you already know, at P14, the photoreceptor layer is degenerated uh, significantly. Uh, it seems that there are still uh, uh, cone arrestin maybe in the inner segment accumulation as well. So we also know now that the cells are dying through apoptosis as measured by tunnel staining. So at P10, I can detect some dying cells um, at, uh, at the photoreceptor cell layer. Again, this at P10, there were already rapid accumulation of rhodopsin, but cell death seemed to have a lag before, uh, or cell death has a lag after rhodopsin accumulation. And I can't detect any tunnel staining in wild type of heterozygote animals. Uh, now, at P14, I do see the occasional tunnel staining in wild type, but as you can see here, there's massive apoptosis happening in, in these animals, which suggests a specific uh, a pathway for cell death for, 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 uh, for these animals. So, we now know that the global NPHP5 knockout mouse have an extremely fast retinal degeneration phenotype. So, how about the kidneys? So I took sections of one month old anim, uh, animal kidneys and noticed that the kidneys uh, in the knockout animals are significantly thinner all throughout, both in the cortex, which is the uh, peripheral region of the kidney, as well as in the medulla, uh, in the middle part. Uh, also, there seems to be uh, lots of holes or cysts, um, particularly in the, in the cortex of, of these animals. So again, presence of cysts and atrophied kidneys are important clinically. So I wanted to explore more why the kidneys are smaller. In the human disease, it's not really well understood why the kidneys are smaller. So again, uh, I thought it was reasonable to check whether the, uh, the cells were dying. So again, I did tunnel staining at uh, kidneys at P28 or month, one month age, um, labeled in green, and the wild type and heterozygote seem to, at least in this magnification, don't show a lot of cells dying. Shown here are two pictures of um, two knockout um, mice, mouse kidneys, and shown is just increased uh, apoptosis primarily in the cortex or the metanephros uh, region. Also shown here is a cyst that uh, must have ruptured. These are just higher magnifications of wild type and knockout animals, showing that there are uh, uh, cells undergoing apoptosis in wild type animals, which is, uh, which is expected because this is a highly proliferative or active uh, 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 cell tur turnover uh, layer in the, in the cortex. But as you can see in the knockout animals, it's just increased. Uh, now, the, the cell death is not just in the cortex, but it's all throughout the kidneys as well, including the medulla, which I'm not showing here. So I've shown that my knockout mice have smaller kidneys, which is probably due to apoptosis and that uh, there's a presence of cysts. Now there's the third clinical finding in humans, which is presence of fibrosis in nephronophthesis. And so I checked for fibrosis using trichrome staining. This is a wild type in heterozygote animals, and trichrome stains, uh, stains fibrosis for blue. And it's harder to see here, but after quantification, there are, uh, there's lots of blue in, in, in the knockout mice. Uh, again, it's harder to see in this picture, but it is uh, significant. Um, this is the blue arrow points to an area of high fibrosis, and this is just another example of, of, of a cyst. So we've confirmed both retina and kidney phenotypes reminiscent of senior Loken syndrome in, in our mouse model. For the second point, which asks what is the function of NPHP5, we think that it is involved in early ciliogenesis in photoreceptors and kidney cells. And so, as I've mentioned, we're just waiting for our EM data to come out to look, f to look at the connecting cilium uh, ultrastructure. But I did do an in vitro experiment to test this hypothesis in a kidney cell line, again, IMCD3 cells. Again, uh, at conditions to grow primary cilium, you can see that the cells grow a lot, uh, you know, each cell will grow one primary cilium, and PHP5 is labeled green and co-labeling with a known um, primary cilium marker acetylated tubulin. 
After knocking down NPHP5 with RNAi, we see that the cells are still there, but uh, have significantly decreased uh, primary sodium, which really suggests that it's involved in early stages of, uh, of, of, of uh, primary sodium formation. I've quantified this, and uh, in my hands, 70%, normally 70% of cells usually develop a, a primary sodium, but uh, no after knocking down NPHP5, uh, the primary sodium numbers decreases to less than 10%. So in summary, a high suspicion of senior Loken syndrome should happen when there's a history of inherited renal uh, disease or a history of renal transplant uh, with uh, retinitis pigmentosa. Now, extra organ involvement, particularly the brain, um, by an MRI scan uh, should rule out other overlapping syndromes, particularly uh, Joubert syndrome that causes both the retina and renal phenotypes as well. Mutations in NPHP5 is actually the most common cause of senior Loken syndrome, and that, knock, and that knocking out NPHP5 in the mouse, um, uh, which is my thesis project, uh, is uh, recapitulate uh, all clinical findings, as far as we know, uh, in humans, which is uh, uh, retina pathology as well as kidney pathology. So we now have a senior Loken syndrome mouse model. So finally, we think that NPHP5 is important in formation of the connecting cilium and primary cilium, and we should know the EM results in basically by the end of this month. So I'd like to end by describing a genetic study that we are also doing in collaboration with Meg DeAngelis. So although most of the mutations causing senior Loken syndrome are known, there are still more genes to be found. And we have individuals that have been diagnosed actually uh, uh, with senior Loken syndrome here at the Moran by Dr. Bernstein. This is uh, the family that Dr. Bernstein is taking care of and also Dr. Katz. Um, and we have already entered them in this study. And I've, we've collected blood and uh, we are going to do whole exome sequencing in this family. And uh, this is uh, just historically speaking, I, I did, you know, when I started this project, I didn't know that we had senior Loken syndrome patients here since because it's a very rare disease. But fortunately for me, Dr. Bernstein is in my committee, and when I proposed this project at the end, he mentioned to me that uh, he, he has patients with senior Loken syndrome. And since then, um, uh, you know, I've found out Dr. Katz is another patient, and uh, in the Department of Nephrology, there's also, a, um, I believe she's nine years old now, that also has senior Loken syndrome. So there's three families, which should saturate Utah, because we have around three million people in Utah, so expecting around three individuals here in the state. So uh, we're doing whole exome sequencing right now um, uh, to find out uh, excitingly probably more uh, causative mutations of senior Loken syndrome or at least existing mutations. Of course, I've genotyped NPHP5 and I didn't find any mutations in NPHP5 in these families. So finally, I'd like to thank Wolfgang for really letting me do this project. Um, this is not his project. So I started this and he, he was very, uh, he's a really great mentor for me. My committee members um, uh, helping me with, with, with the project and I'm funded by an F31 NRSA from the NEI. Uh, so with that, I'd like to take any questions. So uh, throughout my graduate career, that's a question that I've always thought about. And the underlying in all of these uh, uh, maybe studies that I make is my, uh, I guess, uh, interest in understanding uh, more fundamental molecular mechanisms of retinitis pigmentosa specifically or uh, in the syndrome. So I alluded in the beginning of the slide that NPHP5 uh, may, it's tempting to speculate right now, uh, but that it may uh, be involved in calcium regulation and that uh, there may be some calcium uh, <coughs> problems within the vicinity of the connecting cilium with these. And so if that's the case, then maybe hitting it with downstream targets is important. 
Um, now, that's, although that's purely speculation, there has been clinical trials, at least on the kidney disease for nephronophthesis, with uh, basically calcium mimetics as well as downstream MAP kinase inhibitors. Basically, it's downstream of calcium pathways that's shown decreased cyst, cyst progression and uh, increased survival, at least in animal models. And so I think that there's still, I guess, there's still so much to learn about the molecular mechanisms of these basic diseases that is, uh, I guess, uh, also to my surprise, uh, are not uh, untapped uh, un until now. Uh, I'm looking for another model organism actually to test my hypothesis for NPHP5 in calcium organism, in, in calcium homeostasis. And so I'm expressing NPHP5 right now in C. elegans to test my hypothesis. So going back to your question, yes, definitely orphan drugs. <laughs> this is a very rare disease, um, more, uh, more rare than usually were the, the clinical trials for uh, 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 for, for orphan drugs. And I think it's a combination of understanding molecular mechanisms, on, you know, get being better at gene therapy. I'm making also a viral vector for, uh, to rescue this uh, with AAV uh, viruses. Um, so I guess it's a combination of a lot of things uh, for, for, at least for the retina disease. For the kidney disease, you know, for gene therapy, it's very hard. We don't know a lot of AAV viruses that can transduce and give back to these patients. There's problems with renal transplantation. But I, 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 again, uh, the molecular mechanisms are, are uh, I think, uh, lagging behind and that we, you know, we, uh, for nephronophthesis as well, that there's still a lot to be explored. And uh, I don't know the clinical trial now of the two the calcium mimetic and the MAP kinase inhibitor that they've used for nephronophthesis mouse models. So I can't remember what company they were, but. So just one other comment that about that. Uh, National Institutes had a big contest. I'm sure, I don't know if you've all heard about it, where they asked for everybody in the research, actually it was around the world, they accepted the, and it was for what they call our gateway therapy. We, we put out something that's kind of wild, gee, wouldn't it be great if, and they had hundreds and hundreds of these and they selected Enrico, very good job. Unless you have any kind of burning point question, then the other kind of two points from this was uh, kidney location that may be there, so that that would show up on the board of the kidney eye diseases. So you have there is a, a few other ones that you need to know about, like phosphate and then others that do come up that you would have to. Again, in this case, my index case.
So these are autosomal recessive. And these are, at least for these pedigrees, uh, they're not consanguineous. So there are digenic uh, uh, recessive uh, mutations that has been reported for this disease as well. So it may not be just from one allele, but may be for, for two. That may be as well. Well, that's a family that's unusual, this recessive thing. You picked up three out of four of these pedigrees. Yeah, so it, this is. Our next presenter will be uh, Beatrice.